Let's just uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us as your people today. Thank you for your word, the Bible. You've inspired it by your spirit. By that same spirit, work in our hearts that we might hear well and apply what we learn to our life as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got to say I'm glad you're uh, working your way through the book of 1 Timothy because over the years I've come to really love this book more and more. Uh, as a young man it taught me uh, just the importance of living a godly life as I stepped up to become a husband and a father and all the responsibility involved in that. And then when I went into ordained ministry I was struck through the book of 1 Timothy by just how high the bar was set for those who were called to lead in the life of the church. And now, as a bishop, I find myself, I guess, identifying uh, more fully even with Timothy, who was giving the, given the daunting task of caring for the church in Ephesus. So at every stage of my life, I've found the truths of 1 Timothy both relevant and challenging. They're timeless truths because they set out what correct conduct in God's household looks like. Today, as we come to 1 Timothy 5, uh, 17 to 25, which is what I'll be focusing on, we'll consider the Apostles' instructions for the care and oversight of elders. Uh, This section, I guess, is of particular uh, relevance to me as a bishop, but it's also relevant to you as a congregation because you also have a part to play when it comes to caring for your church leaders. Uh, Yesterday, Jenny and I hosted a clergy Christmas party And uh, here's some pictures from last year, Uh, great gatherings, uh, some pretty dodgy Christmas jumpers as well. Um, This year at that party, 160 turned up, Uh, 80 adults, uh, 82 kids, sorry, the other way around. But it was tremendously encouraging uh, to be with them all, uh, both to me, but I trust also to them, great fellowship. As I spent time with the clergy uh, and the other paid gospel workers, I was struck again by the quality of that group of people. God, in his mercy, has over decades drawn together a wonderful team. Godly men and women all who are faithfully serving in 33 parishes all over the northwest. Uh, Having prepared this talk, I found myself looking at them and praying, Lord, please help me to look after these people well. And today, after you've heard this talk, I'm hoping that you as a congregation will be praying that too. Help us look after them well. Well, let's look then at what the Apostle Paul has to say about the church, the care of church leaders. Look with me at verses 17 and 18. He says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the labourer deserves to be paid. So elders here are the overseers of chapter 3. In fact, the two terms are used interchangeably in Titus 1 and Acts 20. The elders or overseers were the leaders and shepherds of the congregation. They were the ones entrusted with authority to teach God's word and direct the affairs of the church. Now here, Paul says those who do this well are worthy of double honour. And the principle, I think, here is appreciation. Hard work performed conscientiously deserves to be rewarded. Double honour implies two things. Uh, It means they should be shown respect in their position and given fair remuneration for their work. Now, how might that look on the ground? First, let's consider respect. I take it that being given respect in their position means, firstly, they shouldn't be slandered, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but their leadership should also be respected in that God's people ought to be prepared to support the direction they set, provided, of course, it is in accordance with God's word. Now, in the Armidale Diocese, the way church leadership and oversight is put in place is that the congregation chooses nominators at their AGM. They, in consultation with me, the bishop, prayerfully select their vicar, or in the case of the cathedral, the dean. He is then given the responsibility of shepherding the congregation through the careful teaching and preaching of God's word. He may also appoint under-shepherds or other paid gospel workers, but also uh, Bible study group leaders, Sunday school teachers, uh, scripture teachers, youth group leaders. 
In consultation with the elected wardens and parish councillors, the vicar, the dean, makes the decisions with regard to the affairs of the church. So together they set the vision, the budget, and generally keep the wheels turning so that the church can continue to, do, to introduce all people to Jesus and help them home to heaven. Now, of course, in Australia, most people have a fairly low view of authority, don't they? They'll respect their leaders if they like them and if they agree with them, but most of the time, they just ignore them. However, that is not how God wants his household to operate. Those who he has appointed to positions of authority and leadership need to be respected. You may not always agree with what your minister says, but you need to respect the authority they have as the appointed shepherd or under-shepherd uh, who are entrusted with your care. It's certainly not the way the world operates, but it is how God wants his church to operate according to his word. Church leaders uh, also need to be supported, which brings us to the second half of the double honour, financial support. Paul sets out the principle by taking us to the Old Testament where God's people are told in Deuteronomy 25, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the labourer deserves to be paid, which is kind of the gist of Leviticus 19 verse 13, uh, you shall not keep the wages of a labourer until morning. It also echoes Jesus' words from Luke 10, verse 7. In his advice to the 70, as he sends them out on mission, he says, Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the labourer deserves his wages. So the principle in these verses is that if someone works in gospel ministry, they should be paid. Uh, where a church leader needs to be freed up from other responsibilities to do their work of leading and preaching and teaching, they should be supported financially by the rest of the church family to do so. Now, here at the cathedral, I'm glad to see that the uh, target budget details are published each week, along with how we're tracking in terms of our regular giving. The reality is that the cathedral is a large parish with lots of great ministry taking place, and if you look at that section if you, in your bulletin, you'll, you'll realise it costs just over $500,000 each year to support the gospel work that happens in this patch. And most of that money goes to the paying of the full and part-time staff team, ministry staff team. Based on the way we're currently tracking, I'm encouraged to see that as a congregation, we're supporting uh, paid gospel workers fairly well. It seems that many do understand that gospel workers deserve their wages, and that is terrific. But just can I encourage you today to keep that on your radar? The ongoing support of gospel ministry shouldn't just fall to a handful of, of generous people, very generous people. As God's people, all of us carry the responsibility and should be prayerfully reviewing how much we're giving each year. Well, can I commend to you uh, direct deposit giving as a way to ensure consistency? Uh, I know at a former parish uh, I ministered in, when people moved to direct deposit giving, it, it was a real game changer. Um, interestingly, that shift was precipitated by a theft of the offertory uh, safe uh, after the Christmas weekend one year. So thieves basically broke into the church. They crowbarred out the safe out of the floor and they stole, stole all the Christmas week offering giving. Now, we were devastated at the time, but you know what? The net effect of that was that most of the congregation moved to direct deposit giving. And in God's providence, it resulted in a much better consistency of income, which in turn meant a stronger certainty when it came to decisions concerning ongoing employment of gospel workers. Now, can I say, I hope you never have a theft of the offertory here at St Peter's Cathedral. But for the reason of consistency of income alone, I commend direct deposit giving to you as a good way forward. Uh, for details on how to go about that, just look at your bulletin. There's a section called St Peter's Offerings by Internet Banking. And you can have a, have a think about that there. Well, moving on, in order to lead along with the double honour of respect and financial support, elders, overseers, need both protection and correction. Look with me at verse 19. Paul says, uh, Never accept any accusation against an elder 
except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As I said earlier, uh, respect for leaders is not always good in Australia. Uh, Slandering or cutting them down is very common. Uh, In some spheres, it's become quite easy to criticise and slander leaders. Indeed, it's a favourite pastime in the media and in the entertainment worlds. But it should not be so in the life of God's church. If there's a problem, it should be dealt with appropriately. Paul suggests a safeguard of not considering an accusation against an elder unless it is on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, I think that's wise instruction. Sadly, the safeguards like these are needed. Uh, I remember back to my uh, days in Mungandai. A woman joined our congregation. She was a little bit older than me. Seemed a keen Christian. She was part of a Bible study group I ran. But one day I discovered all of a sudden she'd moved in with a Muslim man in the town. As a pastor, I went and I talked to them gently but frankly about their new living arrangement in view of the fact that she claimed to be Christian. He was very angry with me indeed and there was absolutely no repentance on her part. So then I took with me one of the Christian Aboriginal elders with me and I spoke with them again, at which point he threatened me. After the second confrontation, that man began to spread the word around town that I was after his woman, and that's why I'd sought to break them up. Now, of course, nothing could have been further from the truth, and people knew that. It was a false accusation that wasn't even considered due to a lack of witnesses and a complete absence of evidence. Now, of course, that's an extreme example of slander, More often, I think it comes in the form of people just talking together about a problem they have with a minister. Rather than coming to the leader, they talk to each other about their discontent. And then the leader hears about it second or third hand. Someone will say, do you know people are saying dot, dot, dot? And he'll then say, well, which people? Uh, What exactly are they saying? On what basis are they saying that? Many a church leader has been discouraged by white anting from people who don't have the integrity or the courage to make an appointment and simply talk through a concern. So can I say today, if you have a concern, please talk to the dean, talk to Sharon, talk to John, talk to Michael, or a member of the parish council. Let's work hard at loving one another and communicating clearly so that we deal with concerns appropriately. Having said all of that, I want to say that I'm thankful to God that we do enjoy a strong sense of unity uh, in our congregation here at the cathedral at St Peter's. The leaders here are spared from slander and enjoy wonderful encouragement and support from the congregations that meet in this building. The flip side of the coin, of course, is that sometimes leaders do go astray. They need to be corrected. Look with me at verse 20. Paul goes on. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest also may stand in fear. So sadly, sometimes church leaders do go off the rails. Uh, I know that when my uh, father Peter came into ministry many years ago, he had to pick up the pieces in the first parish he was in, where the minister had become a drunkard and run off with the organist. I mean... Very occasionally, when he became the bishop, he had to remove clergy who'd fallen into sexual immorality. Sadly, it happens. And when it does, the church needs careful procedures uh, in place to call their leaders to account. Now, to that end, I read uh, recently a very helpful book by a guy called Marcus Honeyset called Powerful Leaders, When Church Leadership Goes Wrong and How to Prevent It. This is Friday night reading for the bishop, okay? But Honeyset talks about biblical patterns of healthy leadership, of legitimate and illegitimate uses of power, and how to avoid sliding from one to the other. He speaks of the importance of good governance and encourages churches to put on their seatbelt through clear procedures, policies and protocols that are implemented in transparent and accountable ways. It's a great book, helpful. In our diocese, we have a faithfulness in service code. I hope many of you have seen this already for clergy and church workers, including all volunteers. That document outlines appropriate boundaries to ensure ministries conducted in a safe and godly manner. 
More important, of course, than that document is uh, this one, <laughs> the Bible. The scriptures must be the ultimate measure and standard for church leaders and indeed for all of us as God's people. So can I say, if you see me or any other church leader failing to live in accordance with God's word, please, for the sake of God's honour, do draw it to someone's attention. Uh, perhaps that person would be the, the dean, you could draw it to his attention, or John Cooper or Sharon Kirk, or a, a warden or a member of the parish council. Uh, you can also talk to me if all the other options don't feel right. But come and talk it through in confidence with someone appropriate. You'll also notice safe ministry posters in the foyer of the church and the parish centre. Uh, they're, they're red so you don't miss them. But these give you information on how to contact the diocesan director of professional standards directly. The Anglican Diocese of Armidale has adopted policies and procedures to prevent and respond to abuse of children and vulnerable people. So if you have a complaint, you can make that safely uh, by calling that number. So, friends, these structures are there to, to safeguard us from sinful behaviour in the life of our church. They enable us to hold wayward people to account and to protect the vulnerable in our congregations in line with Paul's instruction to Timothy. Now, these are important instructions to apply, which is why I think Paul underlines them now with Timothy in verse 21. He goes on, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I warn you to keep these instructions without prejudice, doing nothing on the basis of partiality. Okay, notice there's, there's no room for partiality, that is for favouritism. It's easy to be soft on leaders when they stumble since we all often admire them, we love them, we wish to show them mercy. But the Bible warns us not to overlook their sins but to bring them to account where necessary. Please pray for me as bishop that I will be wise in establishing and administering helpful procedures and protocols to deal with these things. They're often complex matters. So that the, there's good order and faithful ministry might be safeguarded in the life of our church, not just here in Armidale, but right across our diocese. Well, such advice uh, leads naturally on to the next instruction Paul gives to Timothy in verse 22, where he says, Do not ordain anyone hastily, and do not participate in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Well, the best way to avoid the pain of leadership gone wrong is to be careful in the appointment of people to positions of responsibility in the first place. Again, my dad, uh, when he was the bishop, once said to me, Rod, it, is, it, it always pays to choose the clergy well. Much easier to weed out unsuitable people through careful selection than to remove them once they are appointed. He was right. And the same, of course, is true within a church in the selection of leaders for various ministries. The temptation must be resisted to just fill the gaps with anyone who puts up their hand when it comes to a role of responsibility. When someone is ordained, they are set apart for a particular task. Now, that was the norm in the early church. It still is today. Uh, next year, on the Saturday, the 17th of February, I will ordain, through the laying on of hands, six men and one woman for full-time ministry positions in our diocese. Now, I don't do that lightly. Careful selection has taken place. Paul didn't do it lightly either, which is why he encourages Timothy not to rush into appointing people without careful consideration of their suitability. You may recall earlier in chapter 3, he gave the criteria for suitability, both for overseers and for deacons. And that section in chapter 3 makes clear what qualifies people for leadership in God's household. It's consistent, godly character and behaviour. It's seen the way they lead in their home. It's seen in the way they relate to outsiders. It's seen in their attitude to money. It's a challenging list indeed. So Timothy is to take time in his oversight of the church in Ephesus to apply these criteria. He mustn't be in a hurry. Otherwise, if a mistake is made through haste and a scandal results, Timothy himself will share in the sins of others 
and find himself implicated in other people's wrongdoing. And so by taking this advice, Timothy will keep himself pure. Well, I've got to say, Timothy has a lot to consider. He's got a lot of responsibility to bear, doesn't he? And it seems as we read on that leadership in God's church was taking its toll on Timothy's health. Look on with me at verse 23. Paul says, No longer drink only water, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach and frequent ailments. There is a cost to carrying the burden of leadership in the church. In my job as bishop, I see clergy occasionally who are on the verge of burnout. Generally, I don't give them a bottle of wine to sort that out, though back in Paul's day, a little wine was considered medically useful for digestive complaints. These days, I'm more likely to take some time to listen, uh, see if there's some relief that we can give them for, from their load for a season. Uh, Christopher Ash is an Englishman who's written... Uh, some really good books on the care of church leaders and gospel workers. There's this one, uh, first of all, Zeal Without Burnout, Seven Keys to a Lifelong Ministry of Sustainable Sacrifice. This is a great book for both clergy but also for lay people who are juggling uh, loads with family, work and ministry. Uh, also by Christopher Ash is this one, The Book Your Pastor Wishes You Would Read But Is Too Embarrassed to Ask, this one helps congregations to understand the pressures clergy are under that they might be able to encourage and support them well as they go on with the job. You can get both of those books at Kurong. I commend them to you. Friends, ensuring accountability, careful selection and ongoing support are all crucial if we are to sustain good and godly leadership in the church. And failing to do that inevitably leads to pain. Sometimes you see that pain immediately. Other times you'll see it become clear over time. Look at, with me at uh, verses 24 and 25. Paul says, uh, The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sin of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. So whether it's good or bad, it will come out in the end. I can think of a, a clergyman who I knew well uh, some years ago. He was doing really good work. He began spending time with an attractive younger woman who was going through marital, marital difficulties. The minister and his wife were both helping her for over a year. But during that time, he was not careful with his emotional boundaries. He developed strong feelings for the younger woman. At various people could see the signs and warned him of the danger but he ignored them. He then become, became unwise with physical boundaries. His marriage broke down. He was pulled out of ministry. And not long afterwards, the woman moved in with him. They now have a child together. No, not married. The congregation he was ministering to was decimated. You see, that man's sins became obvious over time but the damage continues to trail behind him. Now, to safeguard against such problems in our own diocese over the last year or two, we've put in place the requirement for professional supervision. Um, this is for all of our ordained ministry workers. At least eight times a year, all members of the clergy team are required to have a supervision session with a person who uh, is trained to listen and to ask the right questions to ensure integrity and growth in good ministry practice. And my hope and prayer is that this extra level of accountability and support will safeguard our church leaders from burning out on the one hand, but also from moral failure on the other. Now, in all of this, please keep praying for your church leadership team. Correct conduct in the church matters to God. Remember, Paul has written these instructions for a good reason. Back in chapter 3, he said, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Correct conduct in the church matters because it's God's household. It's the church of the living God. 
It's the pillar and foundation of the truth. Brothers and sisters, the church is precious to God. Can you see that? It is vital in his big plan and purpose for our world. When it comes to godly conduct in the church, eternity is at stake, not just for ourselves, but for all those around us as well who don't yet know Jesus. Now, can I just say, you are greatly blessed here in the cathedral to have Chris and Sharon and John and Michael, more recently, uh, serving you in this parish. My observation is that they do exercise faithful authority in line with God's word. Please encourage them. Pray for them. Support them well as they seek to serve God and you here at St Peter's. That's my job, but it's also your job to love, respect and encourage them that together we might grow in Christ-like love and obedience as we look forward to his return. May God strengthen us to do so. Amen.